Hi, welcome to the Ethics and AI speaker panel. Thank you all so much for joining us. I know it is a busy season. You are welcome to turn on your cameras if you would like. Of course, there is no pressure to do so. And we will get started. If our speaker panelists could turn on their cameras, if they're comfortable, that would be great. Thank you. And we'll be uh, just a quick rundown of the event. We'll have speaker introductions from 6.10 to 6.30. Then until 6.50, we have a moderated discussion where we have questions we've prepared. Then from 6.50 to 7.10, we have an open Q&A session, which is an opportunity for you to ask your questions. As you can see with the QR code here, we'll be using Slido. So if at any time during the event, if you have a question, you're welcome to use the QR code and ask that way. And we'll also have someone moderating, moderating the chat. So if you need assistance, feel free to let us know there. Then from 7.10 to 7.30, we have a breakout room discussion. So hello, everybody. My name is Perimeda. Before we start our discussion panel by introducing our academic speakers, as a note, um, Prof. Soden won't be able to join us, unfortunately, due to a personal uh, emergency. Nonetheless, we hope to have him in our future panel sessions. So carrying on with our academic speaker introductions, if we could start with Professor Grass. Hi, I'm Roger Gross. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science. I work on machine learning and in particular algorithms for deep learning. So um, neural nets are a kind of machine learning algorithm that have become uh, very um, widespread in the last decade used for uh, all the best performing systems in vision and um, language understanding and robotics and across the range of AI. And so my own research is on the fundamental algorithms for neural nets. Um, so uh, getting them to train faster, to uh, generalize better to new data and the data that um, comes from different distributions than the ones that are trained on, um, being able to get good uncertainty estimates from a neural network, um, how to automatically tune the hyperparameters of neural networks. Um, so problems like that. And uh, machine learning has a wide range of styles from theorists who um, prove theorems all day to um, very applied research. And my research is uh, pretty much in the middle. Um, it could be described as maybe theory-driven empiricism. So like we use a lot of math, but the goal is to understand um, practical neural net issues. Um, so we're de definitely interested in making something useful at the end of the day. And um, there's another thread to my research that we're just sort of getting started on. And this might be why um, I was asked to be on the panel. I'm also very um, concerned about the long-term safety of AI. So um, AI systems are getting more and more powerful. And um, at some point, they'll probably exceed human abilities. And once that happens, um, will we still be in control? Right? So if you um, give an um, AI agent some objective function to optimize, like uh, make lots of paper clips, then it could you know, take that very far, but it could be very effective at optimizing it to the extent that it decides to acquire more resources and um, try to you know, take actions to prevent us from shutting it off and things like that. And so um, even though this is probably still um, decades away at least, um, it's an important enough problem that we need to um, start understanding it now and do the fundamental research to understand like how are um, very powerful AI systems likely to behave? Um, when would they um, create these sort of um, instrumental sub goals of acquiring resources and things like that? 
um, how can we um, study these things in the context of um, current day machine learning systems. So that's kind of a new thread to my research that um, I have some the beginning students who are just starting to work on. So that's, um, that's it for me. Thank you so much. And up next would be um, Mark. There we go. Uh, well, hello, everybody. I see there's 47 people in total out there, so that's great. Uh, glad to see all of, well, I can't see all of you, but I can see some of you. Um, my background, uh, like you, I did my undergraduate degree in computer science uh, at the University of Toronto, but I graduated a long time ago, 1975. Um, and it was in my last year that I discovered artificial intelligence uh, uh, in a course that I took and became hooked at that point. And then I went on to Carnegie Mellon University and did my PhD in artificial intelligence uh, there. Uh, I was a founding member of the Robotics Institute uh, there and then returned to Toronto 16 years later and uh, uh, I'm now a professor of industrial engineering and computer science and also a distinguished professor of urban systems engineering. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Association for Advancements of AI and also a fellow of IEEE. Uh, I'm a founding director of the Center for Social Services Engineering within the Faculty of Engineering and also a co-founder of the School of Cities uh, here at the University of Toronto. And my most recent um, uh, role is as director of the Urban Data Center at the School of Cities. Uh, along the way, I started some companies. So in the 80s, I uh, uh, co-founded uh, an AI company uh, in the early 80s and uh, that focused on applications in manufacturing, engineering, telecommunications, and uh, uh, other areas. Uh, grew that to 300 people, took it public, uh, and I held uh, various roles there, uh, Vice President of Engineering, CEO, etc. Uh, and then after I returned to Toronto in 93, I co-founded a company to do online uh, retail software and services. We were one of the first in the world to provide that capability in 1993. Grew that to about 150 people and then sold it uh, about a decade ago. Um, in the last 10, 11 years, I focused uh, a lot of my attention uh, on cities. Um, my background has always been in the area of knowledge representation and reasoning with constraints, uh, focusing on enterprises in general, uh, but so as I said, in the last 10 years, I focused on cities, urban problems, uh, knowledge representation, ontologies for uh, uh, urban data, reasoning with constraints, multi-agent uh, systems. Uh, my uh, concern with respect to ethics and AI uh, is in the realm of multi-agent systems. That is, uh, if cities are going to be increasingly uh, managed, operated by intelligent systems. It's not going to be some single system out there uh, that's going to run a city. Um, it's not going to be one massive neural net. It's going to be thousands of agents responsible for different areas of the city, different functions, different spatial areas, etc. All cooperating, interacting, interacting with each other, uh, problem solving in a distributed manner. And so the, the issue, that issue that I'm concerned with is how do you want these intelligent agents to behave uh, when you, the citizen within the city, uh, has to interact with them. That is, these systems become the primary inter interface between the city and yourself. And so the whole issue of agent behavior uh, is a major concern of mine. And one of those behaviors I'm concerned with is accountability of agents, uh, being accountable for the decisions uh, that they make within this vastly distributed, uh, highly parallel uh, distributed agent environment. Thank you. That sounds interesting. Thank you for that. And next, we would be having Mohammed. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, my name is Mohamed Abdullah. I'm currently a PhD candidate in the Computational Linguistics Group here at UFT. Um, I also did my undergrad at UFT, like right, right before I started this. Uh, my main area of research is in applying machine learning in the healthcare set setting. So 
when Professor Gross talked about application to theory, he's in the middle. I'm closer to the applied side. The majority of my work focuses on um, methods of attacking current ways of uh, de-identification in clinical texts and then trying to improve those methods so that uh, researchers are able to share the data between each other. Uh, when it comes to ethics, um, none of my thesis work is directly related to ethics. However, um, sort of on the side, I've been exploring um, both demonstrations of the need for AI ethics. So like, you know, the very canonical, um, you know, here's how bias manifests itself in clinical language models, what by, you know, underperforming on, you know, minority groups, whether that's race or gender or insurance status, if you're talking about the US. Uh, but my sort of most famous work um, that got a lot of coverage was sort of a meta AI ethics approach where I study um, the structures wherein AI ethics is being developed and the effect that these structures have on, um, yeah, on the ethic, on the resulting ethics. So, for example, the diversity of the people doing the research will have an effect on, you know, the types of solutions that we propose or the things that we think up of because we all have different experiences. Um, my most specific work focuses on funding. Um, yeah, uh, so the claim of my research basically is that private interest funding biases research and should be actively studied. And I compare the behavior of Big Tobacco with the behavior of Big Tech by showing how they basically use the same strategies to monopolize the conversation around AI ethics. And this seeps into academia. Uh, and my research shows that, you know, 58% of all computer science professors receive funding uh, from these companies. And 97% of AI ethicists are receive, have worked or receive funding from these companies. And that's not to say that you know, working with them or receiving their funding makes you a bad person or necessarily force that, that you agree with them, but it increases the chances that you are likely to adopt their viewpoints or at least internalize some of the limitations that they've placed. And if you've been keeping track in the news, um, my work was largely theoretical when I was doing it last year and it was published last October, but then in December, Google fired Timnit Gebru. And then later in December, you know, it was leaked that Google forces its researchers to, um, uh, any research product that goes out of Google, for example, has to undergo public relations. Uh, the public relations team has to vet it and approve it. And that basically is concerning. And my work tries to get more people to be aware of the situation and try to figure out solutions to fix it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And now it's on to Elena. Sorry, before we move on there, we're gonna, we still have our last speaker, which is um, Robert. Sorry for that. No worries. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I think I'm the odd one out on this panel in that I'm not uh, a computer scientist and I'm not a computer science researcher. Um, I'm actually from the engineering communication program and my interest is in engineering um, ethics education. And so that's sort of where I play. But just to give a bit of background, I was actually the, uh, the founding director of our engineering communication program. Um, way back in, I don't know, 1996 or something like that. And um, so largely my uh, work has been around uh, technical communication and working across the disciplines of engineering on that. Um, most recently, it's been around design education and communication. And so I, I teach in the first year uh, engineering science design course called Praxis. Um, but I also teach uh, some upper year courses in uh, engineering and society, which have a very strong ethics focus. Um, and uh, so that's, I guess, where, where my interest in ethics started to really um, blossom and, and get interested. Um, and I am coming at it really from the from the complete opposite end to the uh, computer scientists in that I'm coming at it from the ethical theories. And uh, um, primarily recently, I've been interested in the ways in which, um, so there's a theory called virtue ethics and virtue ethics involves the question of how we balance between um, contesting forces in any kind of ethical decision-making. And um, so I've been kind of wondering and looking at how that might play out in AI research and thinking about uh, how that plays into, um, you know, questions of what we do with explicability. Um, so explicability is the, in AI is the concept that um, the 
whatever decisions the artificial intelligence makes should be understandable to humans. And there's a lot of uh, debate around, uh, around explicability and, and whether it is too limiting. Um, so that's sort of, an, it creates an interesting question from an ethics standpoint. So that's one of the things that I've been thinking about. And also we, we are becoming more and more aware that, that AI tools that get developed um, don't consider uh, important the things that we thought they should consider important in, in the um, in the literature that gets called saliency um, is the usual term for that so that what the what the AI thinks it needs to look at to make its decision is completely different than uh, what we think it needs to look at so there's a there was a kind of famous case of the Amazon's uh, recruiting tool, which um, started up, started recommending people for jobs for which they were not qualified because everybody seemed to have the same uh, um, programming languages and programming qualifications. So it started to ignore all that and decided it wasn't salient. Um, and so that raises really interesting ethical questions for how we use these, these tools and what these tools can do. So I'm really interested in the areas of saliency and, and explicability as it comes to uh, how AI is making decisions and how we as people um, can make those decisions and how, in my case, um, young engineers can be educated to be prepared to take on some of those challenges that are in front of us. So I think I, that'll do as, a, as an intro for, for where I'm coming from. Great, thank you so much uh, for our speakers here today to actually answer questions, which will be upcoming, which Elena will take over as the moderator discussion. Yeah, so as Paramita was saying, we are moving on to the moderate discussion. So this is our first question, but before we get to it, I see we have a couple new participants. So I would like to remind everyone that we do have a QR code at the top right and it will be there for every single slide. So at any time you wanna ask a question, you're welcome to make your contributions that way. So the first off we have, how would you define AI? And if I could start with Mark, if that's okay. That's, um, I haven't been asked that question in a long time. Usually I give a flippant answer, which is anything that I do is artificial intelligence. Um, uh, I just view AI as trying to solve problems that humans solve. Uh, trying to achieve levels of problem-solving capabilities that one would normally ascribe to human beings. Um, I don't characterize it in terms of the technology being used uh, because I'm somewhat uh, agnostic as the technology. There's lots of technologies and uh, all of them have their strengths and weaknesses and uh, for most um, AI solutions, uh, the solution tends to be an ensemble of technologies. Um, I know that some people, based upon uh, all of the uh, literature that exists today, that uh, they, they mix up that AI is equivalent to machine learning, uh, but uh, that is not the case. There are lots of different branches of AI and lots of different problem solving techniques. And, representational techniques. Um, but for me, it's all about looking at interesting problems and understanding how we can build machines that can solve them. And for the other panelists, feel free to just jump in. If there are any additional thoughts or another perspective you would like to share. I mean, I, th I think he said it all. Like, I, I wouldn't change anything about what he said. Um, common parlance limits it to the hot stuff, but technically everything that computer scientists do can classify, so wouldn't disagree. Yeah, I would agree also. Um, I think maybe as a, 
machine learning researcher, I can back up what back up the last thing that Mark said about um, machine learning not equaling AI. Um, I think um, machine learning can do quite a lot, um, but there are also a lot of things that we haven't figured out yet in machine learning, in particular um, reasoning, sorts of um, you know, problems that would be um, addressed in the knowledge representation and reasoning group here. Um, and so it's something that we're working towards in deep learning. We have um, a lot of students very, um, very excited about how to um, get these algorithms to do sophisticated reasoning techniques, how to um, combine them with um, things like formal verification. Um, and so, yeah, I think that definitely a, a wide range of ideas that are um, essential. Robert, if you have any thoughts, feel free. Others, yeah, I don't we really can... have any, anything to add. I'm, I'm, on terms of defining the field, I'm, I'm pretty happy to leave the, that to the experts on, in, in the field of AI itself. Yeah, no problem. So we'll move on to the next question. Okay, so the next question to the panelists would be, what do you think is the most important in terms of ethics in AI? If anybody wants to weigh in. Wait, are we answering the, the written question or what you said? I, I got uh, confused. It doesn't also. have to be the most important. I would okay. go with the question on the slide. Yeah, it's just what do you think is the importance of ethics in AI, if not important? I, I, I can jump in from the kind of the the, the ethical theory point of view, and, and that is that um, it's really important because we can't get it wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a human ethical decision-making process, there is lots of room to um, have a do-over. Um, and we can, uh, you know, when we make mistakes, I mean, sometimes mistakes cause wars and, and those kind of things, but when humans kind of make those mistakes, they can, um, they can work through that process and have a do-over. But when we hand that decision process over to an artificial intelligence, um, one of the reasons that ethics is so important is that we may not have a do-over. Um, and, and again, this comes back to some of these questions about saliency and, and, and explicability and, and what, you know, can we even understand what the AI is working on? So for me, I guess one of the reasons I find it really important to think about the ethics is because um, the decisions are potentially very consequential and, um, you know, very fundamental, so. Yes, definitely. Let me, see, let, let me see if I can jump in here. I'm gonna come at it from a very different perspective, um, which is this is not an issue for AI. This is an issue for society in general. It's not an issue about AI. It's an issue about technology. It's an issue about human uh, reasoning systems. Rob, Rob was alluding to that. Um, uh, we don't know how to build human systems that are perfect from an ethics point of view. We don't know how to build software systems of which AI is just one type of software system that is perfect from an ethics point of view. And to suddenly believe that we can impose upon these systems that we're creating a perfect ethical system that they're going to satisfy um, is, what's the word I want? Um, uh, a jump of imagination, okay? Uh, before we had AI systems making decisions about credit cards and mortgages and all these things, we had imperfect uh, humans doing it. And nobody was saying, oh, gee, we have to go and take a look at their training program at the bank to determine whether their training program was ethically based. OK, this is this is an issue of today. Uh, it's an issue of today, not because it's 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 
uniquely AI oriented. It's an issue today because AI systems have made this noticeable to society at large. And that's really what the difference is. And how do we build AI, ethical AI systems? I think the, the, the work that's been done in uh, machine learning, whether it be neural nets or it's uh, uh, decision trees or whatever your, your favorite uh, technology is, um, highlights uh, or gives us the ability to start talking about what it means to investigate whether a system is ethical and what it might take to uh, infuse ethics into it. Prior to that, we didn't have a framework that it would allow us to talk about it uh, technically the way we can talk about it today. It didn't allow us to investigate it technically the way we can investigate it today. Um, so we have a, a, a confluence of technology and awareness and all these things um, that uh, AI has uh, been a catalyst for, um, but it's not a uniquely AI uh, issue. Doesn't mean that the AI world shouldn't be addressing it. I'm just saying that if you're going to focus on it just solely on AI and its ethics, you're missing the mark. It's all systems that are out there, whether they're human or technology oriented. And that's what we have to keep in mind. That's great. Right. Thank you so much. Do any other panelists would like to weigh in or? Yeah, so I, I guess I could comment. <clears throat> um, so I, I could just back up what uh, Mark just said. I, I think um, to a large extent, the sorts of ethical issues that we um, deal with in AI, and I guess referring here to the current day ethical issues, um, you know, I think fairness and privacy are the ones probably getting the most attention. These are definitely continuations of problems that uh, face human organizations. Um, and so in sort of the, the fairness world, a lot of the core techniques um, that are used um, come directly from um, analyses that were done decades ago by statisticians to figure out is there, um, are there biases in hiring practices and education and things like that. Um, and so I guess part of the um, promise of AI is like we can actually um, you know, study these things precisely in the context of concrete systems. Um, there's also, I, mean, I think there are some ways in which AI um, is different from the human organizations in question. Um, for instance, um, humans, I think we can trust to show some judgment, right? And so if they're not not always, right? But but to, to some degree, you know, um, if people have an ethical sense. If you um, tell a, a learning algorithm to optimize for X, it'll optimize for X. And if that um, has the consequences of like uh, completely like disadvantaging some ethnic group or something, it'll just do that, right? So, um, there, so there are right. There is a sense in which we would have to pay um, more attention to some of these issues than, than you would for a human organization. Um, but I, I, I think also on, on the optimistic side, like, right, th th these systems are things that we can actually like analyze in a lot of detail and maybe have a better hope of actually uh, fixing the problem. Um, so that, that, so I also want to sort of distinguish the um, current day ethics from the long-term ethics. Um, I would actually, put these in different buckets. Um, they require um, different solution methods. Um, so we, right, so the long-term safety of AI systems, we have to figure out how to accurately determine human values, how to um, prevent a system from strongly optimizing goals that are at odds with ours. Uh, we can't really um, wait for these problems to be solved in order to uh, fix the ethical problems that are happening right now. Um, so, um, and, and I think currently the, the size of the research fields, I think the, the current day AI ethics field is about 10 times larger than the um, long-term um, AI safety field. Uh, I think both of them should be um, much larger than they are now, but um, I think that's yeah, um, roughly the ratio right now. 
Okay, great. All right, if there is nothing to add on, then we could probably move on to the next question, if that's okay. So how is AI developing in your domain? So I, I can take this one first, I guess. Uh, so I work in the healthcare domain. Um, you know, it, it's progressing nicely, I guess. Like it, we're doing things that we didn't think we would be able to do, uh, especially if you look back like a decade or more. Um, however, it's not um, it's not ready for deployment. There's a lot of issues, especially with to, uh, like generalization, ability to deal with things outside of distribution, knowing when you're going to fail. They're still not solved. So. It is developing nicely, but there's still a lot of room for improvement before we actually see it at scale in the healthcare setting. So I think one of the main trends in deep learning more broadly um, has been that a relatively small set of very generic algorithms are able to do a much wider range um, of tasks than were done previously. And so if you looked at any of the applied conferences um, 10 years ago in the computer vision or language processing, um, they would have been using um, techniques that were like very specialized to a particular task. Um, people would have spent a lot of time um, constructing uh, features for learning algorithm and things like that. And um, over the past decade, that's been replaced by um, neural networks where there are a fairly um, small set of architectures that you can train directly from the um, raw data. And so the same architecture would be able to handle a lot of different problems. And over the past few years, um, even sort of beyond just the existence of deep learning, um, there have been, well, th there was a, a very um, generic architecture called transformers um, based on um, the kind of self-attention uh, processing, which are able to do surprisingly sophisticated, um, what, what appears to us to be reasoning. Um, so there's a system um, from OpenAI called GPT-3 um, last summer, where um, people asked it um, questions like from physics interviews and things like that. And it appeared to give uh, pretty sensible answers that we would have expected to require reasoning. Now, it could be that like the same question was like somewhere in the data set in some other form, things like that. But um, we're at the point where there are like very generic algorithms that we're very surprised at what they can do. Um, another trend that's very relevant to AI forecasting is that there are very regular um, scaling laws of AI systems. Um, as you give them more data or more compute resources, you can plot the performance versus resources on a log log plot, and there'll be an extremely regular curve. Um, it'll you'll be able to extrapolate over orders of magnitude, um, and so um, AI systems will you know even if there are no algorithmic advances, they'll continue to um, get better and better in a very predictable way. Um, so I think these are some of the um, main trends that are relevant to. Um, in both the short-term and the long-term ethical issues. I guess I can weigh in from a city point of view. Um, the, the problem with cities as a, an application area is that cities uh, span everything. I mean, they have health departments, they have transportation departments, they have, you name it, they have everything that you can imagine. Um, and so we're, we're seeing artificial intelligence finding its way uh, into all of these uh, divisions of a city. Um, but I, I tend to, to view these systems that are being put in place as operating on the margin. Uh, so if you uh, look at its application in transportation, where are we seeing applications? Okay, smart traffic lights. Uh, being something that a lot of people have been working on and cities are experimenting with. Or from a water point of view, smart water fountains. Or um, from a, a uh, public safety point of view, uh, face recognition uh, being used, which causes a lot of 
heartburn for many people around the world, especially when it comes to privacy, etc. A um, lot of work in diagnostics, whether you can diagnose uh, a sewer pipe is going to be failing. Uh, uh, so lots of opportunities for diagnosis, but a lot of this is at the edge. And, and the reason I, I say that is, is that when I look at uh, where the money is being spent um, in a city, the billions upon billions of dollars is not being addressed by any AI, AI systems that I'm aware of. And so one of the, I, I have a project with the city of Toronto uh, in the area of Toronto Water, uh, in which we're looking at creating knowledge representations uh, uh, to represent the entire Toronto Water system for water and sanitation, both the, the horizontal systems, which are the, the pipes, and the vertical systems, which are the processing plants. Um, because they want to know what their assets are and they want to be able to uh, understand under what conditions they fail or if they fail, whether the entire uh, system will fail, whether their service promises will be kept or not. And so there's a whole area there. But if you go and say, is AI really being focused on that at this time? From a research point of view, yeah. From an operational point of view, not so much. Um, and we get to see that in a lot of places. Transportation, it's at the edges. Is it actually running the transportation system? No, not really. Um, when you go and you look at what companies have done uh, in cities, a lot of that stuff isn't even AI. It's creating a control room with, with very large uh, screens and providing enough seating in, in a single room that uh, everybody from the different departments in the city can actually be in this room at the same time in case of an emergency. Uh, Rio de Janeiro is, is uh, a good example of that. Uh, where in order to deal with mudslides and other other emergencies, they never had one place where the different uh, divisions within the city could be in the same room and talking to each other. Um, and that allowed them to actually see through the cameras what's going on and talk to each other. This was an AI, but this was called smart cities. And you see that all over the world, these control rooms that are there. Just as a side note, one of the things they forgot to do in the Rio de Janeiro um, uh, control room was to put enough electrical outlets so that people could charge their, their cell phones. And so the only way that people could communicate with each other was with cell phones, but they were all dying. Uh, the batteries were all dying because they didn't have, couldn't plug their chargers in. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of promise. And, and as uh roger and mohammed uh, have alluded to there's been great breakthroughs in the whole neural network uh, uh world that has allowed us to do a much broader set of pattern recognition tasks uh, with much greater accuracy and the expansion of that beyond basic pattern recognition to other types of tasks is, is just totally fascinating um, but for a lot of the applications within the city world, it's still operating at the edges and not getting into the mainstream of what a city does. And, uh, so I'll just comment real quickly from the, from the ethics field. Um, it, it, it's really active in two ways. One is as case study. Uh, so uh, ethicists are interested in, in the cases, usually the cases where things maybe are going awry but uh, are, are interested in the cases. Um, and so there's a kind of a case studies approach. And um, I guess, secondly, and this maybe relates to, to I, I love Roger's distinction between the, um, the short term and the long term. I think there is uh, an attempt to build a, um, a robustness in ethics that will allow us to think in the, in the, through the longer term as opposed to just dealing with cases. I think that second one is still very much in its infancy. And that's, um, I mean, that's a human, human thinking domain um, that needs to reach a point where we can make use of it in the, in the longer term questions that we have. Um, this comes back to the point Mark made earlier about the fact that these are, these are human questions ultimately that we have to re uh, reckon with as a society, but that, that's sort of what, where these things are, that I see them in the, in the ethics domain now. Thank you so much. So what are the current open challenges and ethical issues? If we could probably start with um, Roger. 
Right, so um, I'll leave the other panelists to talk about the short-term issues. Um, for the long-term safety of AI, I mean, it, it, it's sort of hard to know where to begin with this problem, right? Because how do we reason about um, systems that um, might not exist for several decades? Um, and so I think the key things that we can do right now, uh, I mean, part of it is better forecasting of AI progress. Um, so the, there, there's um, you know, tons of work being done, just like understanding the effects of climate change, right? And, and forecasting what is going to happen under um, different scenarios, um, how, long, you know, how long will it be before we have to worry about this and that. And um, very little of this is being done for AI progress and, um, and actually um, developing a rigorous science of AI forecasting seems very important. Um, there are also um, certain aspects of the problem that can probably be studied um, with current systems. So um, figuring out um, how to um, learn about human values um, is an important area. Um, understanding uh, the sorts of phenomena that might occur um, in the powerful AI systems that we'd be worried about down the road. Um, so um, when is an AI going to try to solve the problem by um, constructing some other agent and giving it an objective function? Um, this is something that um, has analogs in current day deep learning, um, totally harmless, um, but ones that I think we can study and will um, give us a lot of information about uh, what might happen down the road. Um, so these are uh, some of the key areas I think we can make progress on right now. I think there are also um, fundamental political issues that need to be addressed um, for long-term AI. Um, because if we um, buy this idea that an AI system uh, can become extremely powerful, then we also have to worry about the kind of political legitimacy issues. Um, you know, right now, there's sort of a debate between um, the uh, unipolar and multipolar scenarios. Do you want one organization with a powerful AI and do you, or do you want uh, multiple competing organizations? Um, but this is sort of an overly Hobbesian view. There's essentially you're choosing between the state of nature and the Leviathan and figuring out um, you know, when powerful AI is developed, how do we actually give it um, some form of political legitimacy um, is a problem that's gotten almost no investigation so far and seems a uh, very high priority for society to figure out. Definitely. Um, does anybody else want to weigh in or is that all? Okay, I'll take a shot. Okay. Um, I think I think there's in my mind there's always a distinction between let's say and I, I hate to use this phrase but I'll use it anyway AI in the small and AI in the large. Um, and what I mean by AI in the small is is uh, a particular algorithm that is going to do some task that exists in a single agent versus AI in the large when we're dealing with thousands of agents distributed spatially, uh, functionally, etc., cetera, co cooperating, competing with each other uh, in accomplishing whatever their objectives may be. And um, first of all, uh, that's not here today. It's not going to be here. Uh, from a technology point of view 10 years from now or 20 years from now, um, but it's a challenge. Uh, how do you achieve, where does ethical behavior come into a large-scale distributed agent uh, environment? How do you impose ethics? Uh, uh, we tend to, from a, a computer science or operations research point of view, talk about uh, injecting an objective function. 
uh, but we also talk about injecting constraints on uh, the problem-solving behavior of some reasoning system. Um, but we, we talk about it. We know how to do it in simple situations. We don't understand how to do it in these massively parallel environments. And so for me, the long-term challenge is what does the uh, massively distributed multi-agent systems look like? How do they behave? How do we control their behavior? How do we inject uh, ethical behavior within it? How do we achieve accountability uh, within those systems? Uh, all of those are the issues uh, that I am concerned about. And uh, I think the ones we're going to be seeing many decades down the road um, and our consideration today of how one injects ethics, whatever that might mean, into a, a AI in the small, a single reasoning thing, um, is one step along that path. Um, but it's just one step. There are many, many more steps to go. And I wouldn't be able to lay out exactly what that path looks like because I think we're in early days on all of this and we don't even understand what the lay of the land is in the long term, let alone what path to take uh, in it. Sounds good, thank you. So let's move on to our last question that Elena will put. I know that um, some of the speakers have talked about long-term considerations and Mark just mentioned how there is still uncertainty there, but we will still pose the question in case there are um, other thoughts from other panelists. So where do you see AI ethics progressing in the next 10 years? Perhaps you can start with Robert. Boy, I wish I knew. Um, that's a crystal ball question, of course. Um, I feel like uh, from, the, from the ethics uh, research side of things, um, the research is very much playing catch up to the technology. Um, and I, I was really interested in Mark's phrase that he used a couple of times, the idea of injecting ethics into uh, the AI system. And, and I think, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting uh, metaphor. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's almost like the, uh, your COVID vaccine. Um, and, and I guess, you know, that, that speaks in many ways to the, the nature of the challenge. You know, what is, and is the vaccine, is the, is the ethics vaccine that we need to inoculate our systems with, is it, is it that, what's its efficacy, you know? And, and um, so I think that uh, as we look forward, the problem of our human societal uh, constructs continuously playing catch up to where the technological is, um, I, I think that's, that's problematic. Um, and I would be really interested to see how we can um, get ahead of it. And I don't, I, I, I don't have answers for that. I, I mean, that to me is, is perhaps one of the big, big questions that we have to deal with. So, so just learning from history, kind of, um, we, we, we as humans kind of, kind of suck at you know, fixing ethical issues within human society. Like it takes more than 10 years to do anything. So I think it's very optimistic to assume that anything like significant will happen within 10 years. Like there'll be a lot of research, um, you know, and like maybe theoretical progress, but, um, I think 10 years, you're thinking way too small of a timeline for like anything of significance. Think about like, you know, how long it took to do anything with humans, uh, it takes forever. So, yeah. I'll see what I can do on this one. Um, the, I see AI ethics progressing in a fantastic way 
in faculties of law, departments of philosophy. I mean, this whole area of AI ethics is just a wonderful area for the rebirth of parts of the university uh, that have been ignored for some time. Um, whether it has any impact whatsoever uh, in any major way on the technologies that are developed over the next decade. Um, and I, I totally agree with Mohammed. I mean, 10 years is, it goes by in a flash. Um, the, the impact on, on all these technologies in 10 years is going to be, um, uh, there will be change, but there's not going to be massive change. And we need to be talking in multiple decades uh, to understand what that change is. But the biggest impact will give something to, for people to do in the departments of philosophy and faculty of law, and there's going to be lots of papers published and um, exciting, you know, sources of funding, and that'll be somewhat of a minor impact on what we're doing. Roger, do you have any closing thoughts? Do you have anything to add on this one beyond what I've said previously? Okay, no problem. Can, can you go back to the previous slide? I like that one. Unfortunately, we are short on time, <laughs> but is, are you referring to this slide? Yes, I am. Yeah, hopefully, because we are moving to the open Q&A session, so if we still have time, then we can definitely come back to it. And I'll pass it on to Serena. Yep, so we'll just be going into the open Q&A session. And because we are a little behind, we're about um, 13 minutes. So we'll extend this session to around 7.20 and then we'll go into the breakout rooms. And while we're answering um, during the session, if you have any other questions, um, you can continue putting them in, in Slido. But, and, and if you also see ones that you want to be answered, please upvote them. And to start off, actually, the first question does kind of relate to the dangers of AI. And it's so Jake asked that in regards to holding agents accountable, who would you say should be liable when agents make mistakes or there is a danger? I don't think the answer is any different than uh, uh, what we currently have in, in terms of liability for mechanical devices. I mean, uh, if uh, if you get killed by a car and uh, it turns out to be a defect in the design or manufacturer of the car, then it's the manufacturers of the automobile uh, that turn out to be liable. If it turns out to be uh, the operator that was the source, and then they become liable. Uh, so work backwards, you know, what AI system are we talking about? Are we, t are we talking about the AI system based upon, uh, are we talking about the designers, the implementers of that AI system? Or are we talking about the uh, organization that applies it incorrectly? Okay, so I think the, the, the law actually has been laid out uh, for dealing uh, with those types of situations. Um, so also um, in the chat, Jake was saying that the, the question might just be who should be in charge of um, forcing these companies to make changes. And I guess in this case, you would say that it would, um, there would be regulations and law in order to do so. Correct. I see. Um, would anyone else like to? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then would anyone else would like to share more about this question? If not, then we'll move to the second one. This one is um, more specific and also from Jake. So Apple proposed to begin scanning iCloud photos for illegal content. So what laws should be so legal that this invasion of privacy is permissible and who would decide that? What laws should be so illegal? I, I, I'm unclear on the question. Um, 
So, Jake, please tell me if I'm interpreting this wrong, but is, are you referring to um, what contents are so legal that would allow the invasion of privacy when you were referring to um, what Apple's doing? Perhaps we can move on to another question and then we can let Jake type it out. Yeah. Okay. Then, so the third one that we have currently is, what are your opinions on how to model morality for a general artificial intelligent agent? Sorry, Serena, I had trouble hearing that question. Can you ask it again? Yeah, so, um, so what are your opinions on how to mo model morality for a general AI agent? I mean, like, shouldn't we get first get to the general AI agent before we get to modeling the morality of the agent? I think that, like, uh, it's a, you know, tongue-in-cheek answer, but I like, like Professor Gross said, right? Like it's a, it's a very open and young research area. We can't give you a plan of exactly how one would do it. Um, and I guess um, from Akshat's question, it's so what would, how would you view on how we would approach this instead of how we would do this? So like, what are your thoughts on how, how we would, how, like, let's say it would impact um, other aspects of society or how once we have a general agent that has that. Sorry, I'm not responding because I couldn't really understand what the question was. Um, okay, I will repeat it again. So what are your opinions on how to model um, morality for a general AI agent? Oh, that's easy. Okay. Number one is I don't have a general AI agent. There's no such thing as a general AI agent at this particular time. So you're asking me to, to, to give you an approach to something I don't even know uh, that doesn't exist. Okay. And that's the first problem with with the question. The second problem with the question is, I don't know what general morality is, okay? Morality is different based upon uh, the culture I'm in, okay? And so I now have to define what morality means, and I don't have a good definition of that either. So I don't have a good definition of morality, and I don't know what a general AI agent is. Um, therefore, I'm sorry, I can't provide an answer. Well, I can give an answer that's a twist on that one, um, <laughs> which is let's let's be careful not to build a general AI agent. Um, and so I guess when I say that, um, a lot of the risks that we talk about from long-term AI um, have to do with a powerful agent that is some sort of utility maximizer or it's um, directly um, trying to accomplish some objective and it takes actions um, in order to achieve that. Um, but one option would be like, make sure we don't build that. Um, and so um, there was a very interesting proposal by Eric Drexler a couple of years ago called Comprehensive AI Services, um, which said, if you kind of extrapolate the way that um, AI has progressed, um, we're building um, systems that are um, specialized for performing particular tasks really, really well, um, like, uh, translating between languages and interpreting images and things like that. And um, almost anything you could think of that you'd want an AI to do, uh, you could probably um, describe or they, they build um, by combining these pieces together um, with a sort of thin manual layer at the top. And none of these individual components would be, would have a reason to optimize um, any particular utility function. Um, and so one option would be like, you know, try to build something like this instead of something that is optimizing an objective function. 
um, you'd have to worry about whether there would be some like optimizing process that will emerge from it. Um, but uh, I think this is one plausible approach you can take to long-term safety. I see. And so I think I see that Jake has replied in the chat. And so just to repeat the previous question. So Apple proposed to begin scanning iCloud photos to detect illegal content. And so he was wondering which laws would be so legal or so serious that the invasion of privacy is permissible or allowable and who would decide that? The voters would? I mean, like this is quite, quite a personal question, right? Like, I don't think even murder should allow someone to go through everyone's iPhone picture. Uh, like, like I, it's, some people would disagree, but it's, it's, it's a very personal question and different people with different moral like views of morality will have different conclusions and the way the law is decided is by voting on people who represent, at least in theory, your views. Like, I, I don't think this is really, really like an AI question. It's sort of like a, yeah. I see. Then I guess on top of that, um, so in democratic, democratic um, countries, it would be by the voters, but I guess in the case of where there are different political systems, it would just vary a lot in that case. Well, I, I mean, like, then, then it doesn't matter what, what we think, does it, right? Like, yeah, like, yeah. Um. Right, okay. It kind of comes back to the point that Mark made earlier about the fact that morality is variable um, and, and is culturally specific. Um, and so what is legal is le likewise constructed out of a sense of uh, right and wrong in, in, in a particular case. Um, and I mean, we can just look to the, to the United States and we can see the sort of uh, culture war that has bloomed in the last five years around um, progressive versus uh, conservative values and, and, uh, and how toxic that's become. And you kind of go, you know, how do you deal with modeling moral agent? How do you deal with these kind of legal questions? Um, those are really challenging. And I think, again, those come back to being human questions. And, and there, are, there are laws, but they're all over the place. So the people in decision theory have been studying these types of questions for a long time and just studying trade-offs and creating scenarios in which you have to make a choice, et cetera. The, the problem I have with the question being po posed is it treats the world as being black and white, okay? And, and reality is all sorts of shades of gray. And there's no answer at the outset uh, that will satisfy everybody all the time. And if you think about our political system, at least within Canada, um, we recognize, number one, that an individual uh, does not have enough information to actually make decisions. Um, and so we don't always go to the public for referendums on every single decision that Parliament has to, has to make because we elect our members of Parliament uh, to make those decisions for us because they have staff who help them by providing additional information to make better decisions than, than we can make. But even when they're paid and provided the staff to make decisions which result in laws, those laws are imperfect. Um, and so there's no absolute, there's no perfection here. Um, and we always have to keep that in mind. We operate in an imperfect world with imperfect systems that attempt to do the best they possibly can. Um, and we have to feel com comfortable with that. We have to be comfortable with that, that not everything is going to turn out the way we want it to turn out. I see, thank you for answering. And I think we will be um, wrapping up for the Q&A session and we'll move on to the breakout rooms where, um, so the participants will be able to move between breakout rooms and the speakers will be in different breakout rooms.